In chapter 10, we covered the cell division mitosis. And the goal of mitosis is to create two identical cells, assuming that everything goes correctly. Now in meiosis, this is also a cell division that happens only in eukaryotes. And the goal is going to be different than the goal of mitosis. With meiosis, the goal is to do two separate rounds of cell division. The result will not only be four cells, but those four cells will be genetically distinct from the original cell. And that is because they will have half the number of chromosomes. So we keep the identical number of chromosomes with no variation when we do mitosis. And we not only reduce the amount of genetic information, but there is actually some reshuffling that will happen with meiosis. The examples on this page are dealing with eukaryotic organisms, even though they appear quite distinct. We've got two different animals, both hippopotami and flamingos, and then we have some Joshua trees. However, they are all eukaryotic organisms. They all have a nucleus. They all have linear chromosomes. They all go from an original fertilized initial cell and undergo mitosis to create the multicellular organism. And they all undergo meiosis during reproductive processes. I have put some definitions here and a link to the Khan Academy that explains these terms in more detail. We saw those uh, last week in lab for meiosis, and now we're going to go into some greater detail and not just the chromosomal movements. A gamete is a sex cell. So for animals, we're talking about egg and sperm. They may have different names for different types of organisms, but it's always a sex cell. And it will have half the number of chromosomes. A zygote is a fertilized egg. So the very first cell that any of us ever were. And as soon as cell division begins, and there's that first mitosis after the fertilized egg, then we are no longer a zygote, and we are becoming uh, on our way toward becoming an embryo. Haploid is a term that describes a cell or an organism that has only one of each type of chromosome whereas diploid is a cell organism that has pairs of homologous chromosomes. So then we need the definition of homologous chromosomes. Those have the same genes, so bits of genetic information that encode a product or a characteristic. And those genes are in the same order on each of those homologous chromosomes, but they originate from different parents. So no matter your gender identity, your biological or chromosomal sex, you have half of your chromosomes came from your maternal parent and half of your chromosomes came from your paternal parent. All the time in all of us. I've provided links to some YouTube videos that come from the Khan Academy that will undergo great detail for beginning of meiosis to prophase and then all of the phases of meiosis one and all of the phases of meiosis two. I'll preview those a little bit in this lecture, but leave you to be able to refer back to those if you need greater detail to understand the process than what I'm going to provide in this lecture. So first one is talking about meiosis one. I mentioned that there are two separate cell divisions. And it talks about chromosomal crossover. The phases of meiosis, as you saw in lab last week, have similar names to the phases of mitosis. We have prophase, where the genetic material begins to condense. There are some other factors that happen, but we can finally see the chromosomes. The mitotic spindle forms. They begin to be attached to the chromosomes. We have metaphase, where chromosomes line up in the middle. We will see the difference in meiosis from mitosis. In mitosis, 
the chromosomes line up single file along the metaphase plate. In meiosis one, pairs line up on that metaphase plate. The next phase is called anaphase. In mitosis, the sister chromatids pull apart. In meiosis one, the pairs pull apart. After anaphase comes telophase. In mitosis, telophase means the nuclear membrane forms around each group of chromosomes. That's still what's going to happen in telophase one. The nuclear membrane will form around these groups of chromosomes. Cytokinesis will split us into two cells. And then as we move into meiosis two, those two cells that were formed in meiosis one are gonna undergo a division that looks exactly like mitosis, but it's not the same because what has happened to the chromosomes is not the same. If we start, there we go. Ah, the video is not showing. All right, supposed to be showing the guy talking. So I will leave that be and let you go to the video yourself. We will see those uh, events that happen in meiosis one in the static pictures, and then you can watch the videos on your own time if you need more. All right, video is not progressing. Nope, stop. There's a video, a separate video for the phases of meiosis two. And here we finally have the nice static picture. I'll go back and try to get those videos to play. If we start with a cell, initially in interphase, the interphase is the same as with the interphase for mitosis. It has the G1, S, and G2, the growth phase, DNA synthesis phase, and the second growth phase with checkpoints. And it does seem a little counterintuitive that if we're trying to get the genetic material to be reduced by half, why would we go through the S phase where every chromosome gets duplicated so it's hanging out, stuck at its centromere with its identical chromatin? We don't know why, but we do know how and the benefit of that. Once we get to prophase one, this cell had two homologous pairs of chromosomes. So we have the large chromosome and one's from mom and one's from dad. And we have the small chromosome and one's from mom and one's from dad. So initially it looks an awful lot like mitosis. We've got the duplicated chromosomes. So this is count the centromeres, one, two, three, four chromosomes. The nuclear membrane is starting to dissolve. The centriole is now in our two separate centrosomes with their microtubules coming out that will attach later on. The difference is that in meiosis, we get crossing over. We have what are called tetrads, where these two chromosomes are a homologous pair. These two are a homologous pair. And they're drawn this way not just because there's not a lot of room in that nucleus, but because the homologous pairs actually do hang out together. Synapsis means that we're hanging out together and that allows for the strands of the chromosomes that are from the homologous pairs from the same region to cross over. And when they cross over, it's not just a physical crossover, they break and separate, and now we have recombined chromosomes. So this started as an entire dark blue chromosome. Its homolog was the lavender one, and after crossover, there's going to be a mixture of navy blue and lavender 
on each chromosome. Likewise, the other chromosome has done a crossover. The likelihood of crossover is entirely random. The longer the chromosome, the more likely there will be crossover, and the more likely that crossover will happen multiple times. If it's shorter, there's not as much room, there's less likelihood of crossover and fewer times of crossover. And that crossover event only happens in meiosis, and it only happens in prophase one. In metaphase one, and it is very important to label because there are two separate cell divisions and different things happen during those cell divisions. Metaphase one, we're keeping the pairs that have done their crossover, those tetrads, together. So instead of having a single file of chromosomes, we have pairs of chromosomes along that metaphase plate. They're called tetrads because each chromosome has two chromatids. So if you have one chromosome with two chromatids and a second chromosome with two chromatids, you have four chromatids, four tetra. So our pairs have lined up. The microtubules are attaching at the kinetochore from both sides. That's what pushes them to the middle. The non-kinetochore microtubules are extending past. In anaphase, it is similar to mitosis. The kinetochore microtubules get shorter and that pulls what they're attached to apart. The non-kinetochore microtubules get longer and that elongates the cell. But we're not separating chromatids. We're separating chromosomes. So remember that this dark blue and this purple were a homologous pair. So one chromosome from the pair goes to the left and the other chromosome from the pair goes to the right. The same with this other pair. The entire single chromosome with its two chromatids goes one direction and its homologous pair goes the other direction. So then in telophase, when the microtubules retract, the nuclear membrane starts to form. We're going to have two cells after cytokinesis, and these two cells are haploid. We started with a diploid cell that had pairs of chromosomes, four chromosomes existing as two pairs, and we ended with only two chromosomes because we count the centromeres. There's one, there's two. And so this cell, before we go into interphase again, where the chromosomes are all diffuse, we can see that there are only two chromosomes in this cell, there's only two chromosomes in that cell, and we have recombined bits. This one is mostly lavender with some navy blue. This one's mostly burgundy with some orange etc. So this chromatid did not exist in the parent cell. This little recombined chromatid did not exist in the parent. So the Y of this duplicating the DNA with S phase during the interphase in meiosis is so that we have those four chromatids in our two chromosomes that make the pair so that we can do crossover. We get new genetic combinations that did not exist in the parents. So it's not only that sexual reproduction requires two different mating types cells to come together to create the offspring. When those reproductive cells, those gametes are being made, there's genetic reshuffling already happening before we even get fertilization. So we do have a little resting period after cytokinesis. There's an interphase, but there is no S phase. We're not going to synthesize again. If the signal cell gets a signal to continue with meiosis, we have prophase 2. Similar with the mitotic spindles forming, the same way with the nuclear membrane dissolving. 
the chromosomes condense again. Metaphase two, now we don't have pairs. You can't line pairs up because pairs no longer exist in these cells. So our individual chromosomes line up in the middle. There's a checkpoint to make sure the spindle is attached from either side of the kinetochore so that the chromosomes are lined up single file in the middle of that cell. Anaphase two, the sister chromatids finally separate. And now we can see that this cell is going to get a recombined chromosome that didn't exist in the parent, but it's also going to get an intact or non-recombined orange chromosome. This cell is going to get a non-recombined blue chromosome, but it is going to get a recombined orange one. So we're going to have a lot of combinations. Anaphase 2 looks exactly like anaphase of mitosis. Metaphase 2 looks exactly like metaphase of mitosis. And then telophase, we're going to start to form the nuclear membrane around each of our sets of chromosomes. We're going to split in cytokinesis 2. We will have four cells, each of which is haploid. Now it's very clear that there's only two chromosomes in each of those cells. This example uses a cell that has four total chromosomes to start with because that's relatively simple, or at least it's less complicated. But this exact pattern happens in our cells to create egg cells or sperm cells, except that we have 23 pairs of chromosomes. So during the S phase, we would duplicate all 23 pairs. And in prophase, all 23 pairs get that chance to hang out as tetrads and do crossover. And at metaphase 1, all 23 pairs will line up along the metaphase plate. It's really hard to show 23 pairs doing it. But the exact same thing happens to each pair, whether there are two pair or 23 pair or 146 pair. It wouldn't matter. So meiosis 1 starts with one diploid cell, and we end with two haploid cells, but the sister chromatids are still attached at the centromere. Those two cells enter meiosis 2, so we start with two haploid cells where those sister chromatids are still attached at the centromere, and anaphase pulls those centromeres apart so that we end with four haploid cells. So in humans, we would start with 23 pairs, or that's 46 chromosomes. We would end with 23 individual chromosomes in each of the cells that result. That crossover is not a 2D phenomenon. They're not sitting side by side in a plane for crossover to happen. They're 3D, sandwiched on top of each other. So that's what is being attempted to be shown here. This is a homologous pair. So this is one red chromosome with one centromere. So there's one chromosome. The kinetochore on either side that the spindles will attach to. It is synapsing with the blue chromosome that has the same genetic information in the same order. That's why it is homologous. And so this is called the synaptonemal complex. To synapse means to stick together. It's a synaptonemal complex. There are proteins that are holding these together to allow the breakage and exchange of equal amounts of genetic information. We don't want to change this lower leg for an upper leg. Even though it's from the same homologous chromosome, if we get them out of order, that can have dramatic and perhaps lethal effects. So once we are going to put it back in a plane so we can see how the crossover happens, the crossover happens between non-sister chromatids. So these are sisters, these are sisters. So there's no real reason to cross over between sisters. They are genetically identical. It's going to happen between this sister belonging to this chromosome and this sister belonging to the other chromosome. These letters are just a way to short 
uh, hand list genes. And a gene is a segment of DNA that encodes a specific product, which is a characteristic, a trait, an enzyme. And we have all capital letters ABC on this chromosome because each chromatid is an identical copy. They are the exact same letters in the exact same order. Because this is the homologous chromosome, it has to have gene A, gene B, and gene C in the same order. These are shown as lowercase, which indicates they're carrying information for the same characteristic, but there could be a variation. Straight hair versus curly hair. Dark eyes versus light eyes. Uh, straight pinkies versus bent pinkies. Uh, next week or this weekend, Genetics, we're going to talk about those characteristics. The ability to do this or the inability to do that is genetically encoded. Let's see, what else? Put your hands together. Uh, which thumb is on top is genetically encoded. It's pretty cool. But that's why they're uppercase and lowercase. They are variants of the same characteristics. So in this case, we have the synaptonemal complex. We're going to have crossover between non sister chromatids. And now instead of capital A, capital B, capital C, we have capital A, capital B, lowercase c. And then likewise, lowercase a and b and a capital or uppercase c. We only in this case had recombination between these two. It is because they're not side by side. They are this way we could have crossover between these two chromatids. We could have crossover between the upper portion of these two chromatids. We could have crossover between the upper portions of those two chromatids. Only one crossover is being shown just to make the diagram a little simpler. But we have multiple regions where crossover can happen. So we could have crossed over twice. We've only shown once. The process of what happens during crossover is the same no matter how many times crossover happens. Get me out of the way. There we go. So the assortment during metaphase one is random. And so if we look at our two pairs of chromosomes and they write that as n equals two, the n is the number of unique chromosomes. So there are two unique chromosomes. We see four chromosomes here. Uh, yeah. No, two n because that's the diploid number. So n is there's two different kinds. There's big ones and there's little ones, right? In us, our n is 23. There are 23 different kinds of chromosomes, but they happen in pairs. So our 2n is 46. But again, no one wants to look at 23 pairs of chromosomes all at once in a demonstration of meiosis. So random assort or an independent assortment means when we look at metaphase one, whether we put the paternal chromosome on the left or the right is completely random for every pair along that metaphase plate. So if we only have two different kinds of chromosomes, big ones and little ones, our n equals 2. If we put all the blue ones on the left and all the red ones on the right, at anaphase 1, we're going to split and we're going to get all the blue ones in one cell and all the red ones in another one. We haven't shown any crossover. And so if this one splits in meiosis 2, we can only get big and little blue chromosomes in the resulting cells from this one. We can only get big and little red chromosomes resulting from that. So there's really only two different combinations because in every pair, paternal was on one side and maternal was on the other. With that same starting cell, if in metaphase one, we had the blue on the left on the top pair, but the blue on the right on the bottom pair, at anaphase one, we're going to split this so we have a blue and a red going that way and a blue and a red going that way. But we've got the big blue and the little red in one cell and the big red and little blue 
in the other cell. So that when we split, the two cells that result from this are going to be identical, big blue and little red. The two cells that result from this are going to be identical, big red, little blue. So from this starting cell, there's still only two possible combinations. But from a starting cell before metaphase, depending on this lineup, without crossover, we have four different ways, four different cells that could result, four different genetic combinations. And in humans, since we have 23 pairs, the way to calculate that is that the total possible number of gametes is where it's, uh, it's 2 to the power of n, should be a superscript. So in humans, it's 2 raised to the power of 23, and 2 to the 30, 23rd power is over 8 million possible combinations. So it means each one of us in our reproductive cells that whether or not we choose to reproduce, our reproductive cells are being made. One of your reproductive cells can produce, with the odds, 8 million different possibilities. It's only going to produce two different possibilities. But you have the capacity, through the process of meiosis, of a little over 8 million genetic varieties. And so if one parent can produce over 8 million genetic possibilities, and so can the other, the odds that any of their children are going to be genetically identical are as close to zero as you could get. And that's unless there's identical twins. There are enormous genetic variety. And that is, again, without crossover. Crossover means it's almost infinite, the number of combinations we can get. When we look at what's happening in pro-metaphase, which is late prophase one, that's where our crossover happens. We've got these places where the synaptonemal complex is happening. And here we're showing that by the time metaphase happens and the pairs line up and anaphase is separating them, we're separating this pair but we've got one chromatid without recombination and one chromatid with two places of combination in each of the units of that pair. And then when we get, looks like this chromosome participating in meiosis two, at prometaphase two, we start to get the spindles attached so that the individual chromosomes line up in metaphase two, and in anaphase two, the chromatids come apart. And we have some chromosomes that may have no recomb recombination events, no crossover, and others that may have one or more recombination events. This figure is really tiny, but figure 11.6 does go into great detail what's happening with the chromosomes and the mitotic spindle and all of the other features in a cell during the process of meiosis one and meiosis two. When I was first learning this, the hardest part for me was to wrap my head around the fact that at the end of meiosis one, there's two cells, that's the easy part, but those two cells are haploid. And they're haploid because they don't have pairs. Count the centromeres. The centromere number will tell you how many chromosomes there are. Those chromosomes at the end of meiosis one are existing with their identical chromatid attached, but there's only one centromere per chromosome. That's why we can count them up and see at the end that there are only half the number of chromosomes. So this is showing an animal cell. We know it's an animal cell because we just have the cleavage furrow to split it. If this were a plant cell undergoing meiosis, it would also have to get the cell wall. 
So N is that number of unique chromosomes. A haploid cell has only one of each type. Diploids have pairs, and that that pair has to be one from mom and one from dad. One from the maternal parent, one from the paternal parent. When we look at the comparison of mitosis to meiosis, the big difference, of course, is meiosis has two separate divisions. But there are really big similarities. We have interphase for both initially, and the interphase doesn't change. Same phases, including synthesis for mitosis and for meiosis 1. But meiosis 1 is very different from mitosis because we create haploid cells. And that is because we line up the pairs. We don't line them up individually, we line up pairs. And the pairs split. And it's not till meiosis 2 that we divide the chromatids and create four cells, none of which is genetically identical to what we started with. Mitosis has only one division. We have no crossover. We line up individually, single file at metaphase, and so at anaphase, we pull chromatids apart. And the summary of that, what the process is, DNA synthesis happens in S phase. Synapsis of homologous chromosomes uh, in meiosis, in prophase 1, it does not happen in mitosis. Crossover, it does not happen in mitosis. Homologous chromosomes lining up, it does not happen in mitosis. Sister chromatids lining up, ha, does happen in metaphase of mitosis and metaphase 2 of meiosis. And the outcome is for haploid cells, and the outcome of mitosis is to diploid cells. That's assuming we started with a diploid cell. We needed to start with a diploid cell for both to understand this process. And you have to start with a diploid cell to undergo meiosis. If we have anything less than a haploid cell, it's not going to be functional. However, there are organisms that their whole self, their single-celled whole self, is only haploid. They don't have pain. And a haploid cell can undergo mitosis to create another haploid cell. Whatever you start with, that's what you're going to end with. But meiosis, you have to start diploid so that you can end haploid. Because the purpose is for sexual reproduction to meet up with the opposite mating type cell to create that zygote. The life cycle of animals, such as our cells, the only cells at all ever in us that are haploid are the reproductive cells, the gametes. So in ovaries producing eggs and in testes producing sperm. The sperm cell is significantly smaller than an egg cell and sperm cells, the one diploid cell, will produce four viable haploid sperm cells. The ovary produces the initial diploid eggs that during meiosis 1 there is an unequal division of the cytoplasm so you end up with one big cell and one cell called a bar body. The genetic distribution is exactly as we've described. And then we have the cell undergoes meiosis 2 and creates another big cell and a bar body, and that first bar body undergoes meiosis 2 and creates two more bar bodies. One original pre-egg cell that's diploid divides through meiosis, genetically just as we've described, but it only produces one viable egg cell that has hogged all the cytoplasm, and the other three cells are bar bodies that are not viable. And then the zygote is formed when a sperm fertilizes an egg. We have haploid fertilizing haploid, and we go back to the zygote, which is diploid. We create the multicellular organism through mitosis. 
there's a fungi and other fungi have the life cycle stage that's dominant being haploid. The only diploid stage is this structure called the zygospore that undergoes meiosis to create spores. They, these spores that are haploid undergo mitosis to create hyphae, these long multicellular structures. They can then have opposite mating types that fuse to make the zygote. But the long multicellular hyphae that we see in bread mold is haploid. These haploid spores that were formed by meiosis then undergo mitosis to create multicellular structure that is haploid. And plants also have life cycles that can alternate between a multicellular haploid and a multicellular diploid organism. Depends on the plant if the haploid or the diploid stage is the more obvious stage. The diploid portion is called the sporophyte because it creates spores. The haploid multicellular structure is called the gametophyte because it produces gametes. So the example here is one we're more familiar with. It's a fern. The plant part that we're familiar with, the fronds of the fern, is the sporophyte. It's obviously multicellular. We can see it. And its cells are diploid. It forms sporangia, these structures. You can flip over a fern frond, and you'll see these dark spots. They are where they will undergo the meiosis to form the spores. And if it's meiosis, we know that we're going to produce haploid cells, 1N. These haploid spores undergo mitosis. Same process that we looked at before. We're going to make an exact copy. All the chromosomes duplicate, but there aren't pairs. They're still going to have the little sister chromatids. The duplicated chromosomes line up in the middle, and the chromatids pull apart. They behave the same way. We just don't have pairs. So we have a multicellular haploid organism called the gametophyte. P-H-Y-T means plant. So it's the gamete plant. It is the structure that will produce the gametes. And it does that by undergoing meiosis. Well, it's already haploid. Produces some that are the egg and some that are the sperm. They fuse forms the zygote, which is 2N. That undergoes mitosis to create the multicellular sporophyte. So multicellular diploid sporophyte will undergo meiosis to produce spores that are haploid. Haploid spores undergo mitosis, because they're going to make exact copies of themselves genetically, to create a multicellular haploid gametophyte, and some of those cells will become egg, and some of them will become sperm. Egg and sperm fuse that are haploid. That is fertilization to make the zygote. With other plants, the gametophyte might be even less obvious. The gametophyte of a fern, you have to look at the base of the fern to find the little heart-shaped gametophyte structure. Things like redwood trees, Kind of the whole tree that we see, that is the sporophyte. The gametophyte are the cones. The cones are where they produce the gametes. There is additional practice at the Khan Academy. Provided a link there. That there's articles and those videos and quizzes for each topic. Uh, we're getting into some more complicated kind of invisible things to be able to look at. And so there are some great practices there, and the quizzes all grade right in there. It's not contributing toward your grade in Bio 3, 
but I have been known to pull questions off the Khan Academy quizzes to put on exams. Mm. 